You like the beards. On the subject of relationships, there's a lot of confusion, obviously, in the secular world. And uh, only God provides the instruction, the information, the insight, the wisdom. So if we were to ask a very simple question, and a very important question, what is the attraction of men and women to each other? After psychology and Freud and all of that, we're very confused. What is the attraction? Generally, it is assumed that the attraction is not a holy one, which is a very sad statement, that men and women create an unholiness. That would not be very, very inspiring or very nice. So we really don't know. We don't have a good answer in the secular world. <clears throat> what is the attraction of male to female? But if you look at the description of creation, right in the beginning of, of, uh, of the Torah, of the Bible, there's a strange statement there that we kind of ignore or pass over. And the statement is, God created the first human being, Adam, and this human being was male and female. Then God separated the two of them and they became separate beings, a man and a woman. Immediately upon doing that, God instructs them to get married and become one, which is kind of strange because they were one. And if the objective is to be one, why not just leave it the way it was? So what is, what is the instruction here? What is the wisdom that we're being given? The first human being was created male and female. They were then separated, and they come together and become one again through marriage. This tells us a lot of things that we really need to know kind of desperately. The first thing is, that it is not natural for men and women to be separate beings. When God separated Adam from Eve, or Eve from Adam, that was not the natural condition. Naturally, a human being is both male and female. That's a complete human being. Because there are qualities to the male character, and there are qualities to the female character. Why should a human being only have one of the two? That's not a perfect human being. So a complete human being, by nature, is both male and female. So the separation was really, I guess you could call it, unnatural. And that's why we are commanded to get married, to go back to our original nature. And that is to be both male and female. Now, why did God separate us and then command us to become one when he could have just left us one, as is our true nature? Well, the answer to that is the answer to all the questions about creation. If God wants us to be good, why doesn't he just leave us in heaven? And we'd never have a problem. The answer, of course, is God wants us to be good by our own choice. If he makes us good, well, where's the accomplishment in that? He is good, everything he creates is good. What's the point? The point of creation is to give human beings the option, the freedom of choice, and to have them choose the right thing. That's called a relationship. But if I don't have a choice but to love you, it's not a relationship, I'm just programmed. So God separates us and says, you achieve oneness by your own efforts, by your own choice. Then the oneness is really meaningful. Otherwise, it's 
just our nature. So this explains the attraction of men to women and women to men. It's not a nasty thing. It's not an unholy thing. It is a desire to return to our true nature, to become one, <clears throat> to be whole. <coughs> a human being is whole when he is both, when it <laughs> is both male and female. So to be a he or to be a she is incomplete. You got to be both. And how does that happen? How do you become one? How do you become both? Through marriage, which gives us a whole new view of marriage. Marriage is not a legal way of um, indulging in passion. That's kind of a negative view of marriage. Marriage is actually the holiest condition that a human being can achieve other than obeying God's commandments. But when a human being gets married and becomes one, that's about as holy as we can get. Because going back to our truest nature is being holy. Our truest nature, the way God created us, is the holiest way to be. So when we become one through marriage, we're actually becoming holier not the opposite. Now, uh, the amazing thing, the most, the most inspiring thing about uh, creation and marriage and that whole business, there is the opinion, and there's some merit to it, God created the world because God is kind and wants to do kindness. So he created the world to do kindness for us. There's some, there's some justification for that, for that thought, but not, not enough. If this is God's kindness, <laughs> I would hate to see his bad mood, <laughs> giving us a life full of, tra of, tr of trials and tribulations and difficulties, maybe there's some kindness there but it's not the most obvious kindness in the world. So to say God created the world just to be kind, then life would be much easier. Life would be much, much simpler if it was all about being kind. There seems to be a challenge to life that suggests that maybe there's something else going on besides kindness. <coughs> if we look at it correctly, kindness itself is a creation. Before God created the world, was there kindness? What was the point of kindness? What was the expression of kindness? So if you think about it, God actually invented or created kindness so that his creation can live up to his expectations. So kindness was created for us. We were not created for kindness. That make any sense? It's not like God needs to be kind, so he creates us. God wants to love somebody, so he creates us. We are not the byproduct of love or kindness. It's the opposite. God wants us. And for that, he creates kindness. He creates love so that he can have us. So love was created to serve us. We were not created to serve love. And that should also be true in our marriages. We don't get married for love. We get married for marriage. And love helps. So love exists in the service of marriage, not the other way around. It's not like if we love each other a lot, then getting married will help preserve that love. Marriage is not there to support love. Love exists to support marriage. That's a much more traditional way of thinking. And it's a much more inspiring way. God didn't create us out of love. He created love for us. That's really very, very romantic. That's like saying, 
I want to be married to you, and if being married to you means I have to love you, I'll invent some love. If being married to you means I have to be kind, I'll become kind. I'll create whatever is necessary in order to have you. But it's not that you <coughs> are the consequence of my love. That's not nice. That's selfish. Truth is the opposite. And I, I think there ought to be some kind of an expression, a bumper sticker or something, that says, if I, if, if I need to love you in order to have you, I'll do that too. Whatever it takes. And that's really one of the benefits of marriage. In order to be married, you do need to be kind. In order to be married, you have to be patient. In order to be married, you have to be loyal. In order to be married, you have to love and have some discipline. You see, all of these things exist so that the marriage will work, not the other way around. It's not like, if you're disciplined, if you're kind, if you're patient, if you're tolerant, if you can love, then okay, get married. No. No. The other way around. Getting married is the way to be. And it is so important that if love will help, fine, create some love. Invent love. So that's like saying, if you marry me, I will, I will, I'll get whatever it takes to make this work. I'll even love you. I mean, if that's what it takes. And if, if you don't need love, that's fine too. <laughs> and there are such marriages, by the way. And they're fine. I don't want to be loved. I don't need your love. Let's just be married. That sounds strange. It's not. For certain people, they're not the emotional type. Their mother loved them enough. They don't need to be loved. They're not looking for love. They're looking for a correct, holy lifestyle. So let's do it. I remember a woman complaining once to me that she's married and her husband's a good man and he works hard and he's reliable and he's... But she's a little unhappy because he's not romantic. Now, I knew this woman for many years. And romance was not part of her, uh, <laughs> of her personality description. So I said, uh, can you be a little more specific? What do you mean he's not romantic? And she couldn't. She says, you know, you know, romantic. I said, for example, buy you flowers? She says, no, that's a waste of money. <laughs> I said, you see, you really don't want romance. If he bought you flowers, you'd get angry at him. It's a waste of money. How long does a flower last? Plant a tree. That makes more sense. <laughs> so you're a very pragmatic person. You're a very practical person. What is this all of a sudden? You want romance? You wouldn't know what to do with it if he, if he offered it. And some people are fine that way. All depends on your personality. So. The thought that God created us, not out of love, but created love for us, meaning in order for us to have the kind of relationship that he wants, he even invented love. So for those of us who need to be loved, he'll love us too. But that's not the goal. The goal is to become one. And that's why Judaism's slogan is God is one. Not that there's one God. I mean, you don't have to repeat that every day. <laughs> it's not like every day I wonder, maybe there's another God since yesterday. You don't have to keep repeating there's only one God. When we say God is one, we mean, what is God all about? He's all about oneness. He wants to be one with us. <clears throat> he wants to be one with his creation. And in order to facilitate that, he created kindness and justice and uh, all, whatever it is, whatever it takes. All the fine qualities and virtues are not the end goal. They are the tools. The end goal is to become one. And that's why he gives us his commandments. 
He tells us about himself. God's commandments are basically a, an autobiography. God says, these things please me, those things don't please me, this I like, that I don't like. He's basically describing himself. So those commandments are God revealing himself, bearing his soul, so to speak, so that we know how to become one with him. So every time we fulfill a commandment, we are joining him, we're becoming one with him. And that's why a commandment should be observed with joy. You're becoming one with God, it should be like a wedding. So every time we do a commandment, every time we fulfill a commandment, it's like a celebration. We're becoming one with God. So if there are uh, 613 commandments, there are 613 commandments to the Jewish people, is that too many? Is it too hard to keep 613 commandments? Well, it is hard, but it's so joyous. And if God wants to add a few more, that's fine too. Because every command is, is an opportunity to be one with Him. So the bigger the selection, the more opportunity. And the fact that we sometimes fail, well, that's what marriage is. <laughs> Marriage means, uh, you know, striking out as often as you hit a home run. And that's good. So that's basically um, the traditional and biblical view of life. Basically describes just about everything. Now do you have any questions? We were talking about if you don't uh, follow the commandments, you call that sin? Oh, yeah. And what is your atonement for sin? Try, better, try m harder next time. In a relationship, what is the atonement? If you hurt your spouse's feelings, what do you do? You become nicer. You try harder. You do twice as much. That's your atonement. To punish, what's the point of that? So we're told that in a marriage, you never punish. Because that doesn't help. That doesn't endear anybody. The consequence of sin is, now you're going to have to try harder. Which is good. Productive. So certainly God's patience and God's tolerance and God's understanding and uh, his, his awareness of our weaknesses and shortcomings was all taken into account right from the start. And it actually makes us more precious to God, the fact that we are fallible and we can make mistakes and yet we try. And after we make a mistake, we try harder. That's part of the beauty. So sin is not the end it's not the end of the relationship. It's simply a stimulus for more good things. When did that change from Moses' time? As we all know that Moses, there was, they did more than just try harder. That there was certain things to do for sin. There was. But hopefully, in addition to what they did then, they also tried harder. Because if they didn't, they didn't get much better. I mean, killing a goat doesn't make you into a saint. <laughs> so the sacrifices um, were, were certainly not the main part of repentance. So when did the Jewish people get released from doing the, uh, the symbols and the signs and just try harder? Well, it's, it was something like this. When we lived in our own country, when we had peace, when we had the Holy Temple, then we had the the commandment to bring a sacrifice if we unintentionally violate a commandment. Uh, an intentional sin had no sacrifice. The sacrifice was only for the regret over carelessness. So bringing the sacrifice was kind of sobering um, to make you more careful next time because you sinned out of carelessness. 
If you sinned intentionally, then the sacrifice was not part of the, uh, of the atonement. So when we lived in Israel and we had our own, uh, had peace and we had uh, the temple and everything was good and you sinned, then you needed the sacrifice as part of the forgiveness. Certainly not by itself, because if you didn't repent or regret your sin, the sacrifice wouldn't help. And the prophets railed about that many, many times. What good is your sacrifice if you're still not nice to each other, right? But after the temple was destroyed, after we were exiled from, from Israel, we became the sacrifice. So we don't need anything to sober us up. <laughs> I think on the contrary, we need something to bring back some joy. So the sobering effect of the sacrifice not only isn't necessary, but isn't justified. So now, it's not that we can't offer sacrifices, it's that we're not allowed to. Why aren't you allowed to? Be well, first of all, because we don't have the temple. And we're not allowed to bring sacrifices any place other than the temple. So we're forbidden, actually, from bringing sacrifices. But there's a reason for that. The reason is, when you're suffering yourself, you don't need to bring an animal sacrifice. But when you're living in peace and everything is good and you're getting so comfortable that you're becoming careless, then the sacrifice worked. It justified sacrificing the animal. Today, it doesn't justify. But there was also a time in Moses' time when people had to be stoned to death for certain sins. Yeah. When did that change? Oh, again, it didn't change. It's just that we don't have the authority to do it. We don't have the, the Supreme Court uh, in Israel that could rule on life and death sentences. So in some way, we're uh, better off because <coughs> now it's up to God. You don't have a human court doing it. So God decides, and God is much more <laughs> forgiving than a human court. How yes? Did you lose that, that court? What year did you lose the right to... Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the years were, but just before the destruction of the temple, the, uh, the Supreme Court was disbanded. And then when was the destruction? There was this, the temple was destroyed a few... A Twice. Number of times. Twice. There were two temples. <laughs> yeah, so the second temple was destroyed about 1900 years ago. I don't know, what, what does that make it on the calendar year? About 1900 years ago. But it shouldn't be surprising, by the way. It shouldn't be surprising that when the world suffers, when the world is not at peace, it shouldn't take much for God to forgive our sins. Because under the circumstances, how can he realistically expect us never to sin? If there's peace, if there are prophets, if there's a holy land and there are holy people and everything is ideal, then you have no excuse for sinning. But under the circumstances of the world today, how could God possibly be angry at us for being imperfect? <clears throat> Is it true that the Jewish people do not accept Christ's sacrifice as atonement for sin? Right. Yes, that is true. How about the, uh, when Moses was going, when, when the children of Israel were going through the desert and they sinned, they fell into the deep sin and the, uh, the, uh, the snake was put on a, on a cross or a pole, uh, that was atonement for the, their sin, right? Yeah, that's actually, that was a cure. A cure. Yeah. Kind of homeopathic. They were bitten by snakes, and the cure was the snake. But before a holy God, how can man become holy enough to meet God? Now, there's a good question. There's a good question. If God needs us to be holy, can we ever be holy enough? And by the same token, if God needs us to love him, how much love can we offer? If he is infinite and our love is puny, does our love really work? Can our devotion, can our kindness, can it, can it, can it really 
be significant if that's what God wants. And that's why we have to come to the conclusion God doesn't want our greatness because no matter how great we are, it's not impressive. God wants us. He wants us. He wants a relationship with us. Does he expect us to be perfect? Even if we were perfect, how impressive would that be? We're still human. So God is not asking us to impress him. And we shouldn't be trying to impress him. We should just be willing and desirous of a relationship with him, knowing that we are human. Yeah? So what kind of scale does God use for the Jewish people if the person is good enough? Good enough? To be accepted or accepted? <laughs> I think we've come to the conclusion a long time ago that we will never be good enough. So we gave up on that notion. There is no good enough. And by the way, that's true not only of God. It's true of all the significant relationships in our lives. When is a father good enough? When, when are you a good enough father? Never. Because whatever it is, could be better, could be more. It's an endless. What is a good mother? Oh, what it takes to be a good mother? Give it up. What does it take to be a good son or a daughter? It's infinite. You can never be good enough, which is fine. And your mother will remind you of that every time, at every opportunity. You're never good enough. Husband and wife, you know what it takes to be a good husband? Don't even try. What it takes to be a good wife? Can't do it. So the question of, am I a good husband, is, is a dangerous question. You don't want to go there. Are you trying to be a husband? That's the only question that is relevant. Are you trying? That's fine. Are you good enough? You'll never be good enough. Don't even, don't even think like that. Now you see, if you're an accountant, if you're a carpenter, if you're a baker, we can find out whether you're good enough because it's measurable. You're either making a living or you're not making a living. People are either buying your bread or they don't want to eat it. I mean, we can know whether you're successful or not. But with certain things that are more mysterious and spiritual, why, why even think like that? You know you'll never be good enough. So obviously, the objective is not to be good enough. The objective is to be willing and in the relationship. So a mother who tries to be a mother, that's it. That's the whole story. If she starts to measure or, or judge the performance, it's only going to be frustrating. So we don't try to be good Jews. You don't try to be good enough for God, because come on, when are you going to be good enough for God? And that's not what God wants. He created us with so many limitations he can't possibly be expecting perfection from us, and he can't possibly be impressed with our performance. What impresses him is the sincerity of our efforts. That makes sense. And given the conditions, given the difficulties of life, the challenges of life, if we are sincere in our efforts to do his commandments, what could be better than that? That we do them perfectly? Those are angels. We're not angels. We're human beings. And interestingly, God created angels before he created human beings. What does that tell us? God created angels on Monday of creation, the second day of creation, and on Thursday, on the fifth day of creation. Man wasn't created until the sixth day. What does that tell us? God had angels worshiping him, singing his praises. Didn't satisfy. So he created human beings. And then the creation was complete. So he wants us to be human. He needs us to be human. 
Because what he's looking for is not impressive behavior. Nothing is going to impress him. But certain things touch him. And that is the sincerity of our efforts. And if that's not a <laughs> if that's not a perfect prescription for marriage, I don't know what is. Don't try to be a good husband. Just be sincere in your efforts. Don't try to be a perfect son or daughter. Just be sincere in your efforts. Yeah. So what happens with a Jew that's not sincere? Uh, what happens to a Jew who's not sincere? Well, God will do whatever God will do. Um, eventually, hopefully sooner than later, it will dawn on this Jew that he's not the way he's supposed to be, and he will repent and become good. And again, good doesn't mean capable. Good means sincere. Sincere. So, what would be a bad mother? See, I don't know what a good mother is, but I, can, I know what a bad mother is. A bad mother is basically a mother who regrets being a mother. Everybody will agree that that's bad. A husband is bad if he regrets being a husband. That, that's bad. But as long as he wants to be a husband and is sincere in his efforts, that, that's as good as it gets. That's a good marriage. Good enough? Don't even go there. So when we try to do the commandments, when we're sincere in our efforts, that's not only what, what God can expect, but that's what gives God the pleasure of having a relationship with us. The sincerity of our efforts. Wanting to be in that relationship. A bad Jew is someone who doesn't want to be a Jew. Like a father who doesn't want to be a father. Mother doesn't want to be a mother. But as long as you're mothering, you'll make many mistakes. But that's what mothering is. So as long as you're in the relationship, you're willing, you're trying, you're sincere, that's, that's all. That's the whole package. Does your Bible include the New Testament? No. Why not? That's a good question, but... Uh, <laughs> The Bible basically was concluded or closed um, after the uh, later prophets. Anything after that is considered commentary. And commentary is important, but it's no longer Bible. So there are 24 books of the Bible. And um, after that, it's, it's no longer biblical. So we have rabbinic instruction, we have rabbinic wisdom, we have the Talmud, which is amazing and awesome, and, but it's not biblical. So it's very helpful and very <laughs> enlightening and inspiring, but the Bible was closed after uh, Malachi, Malachi. Yeah? Are you looking for the third temple to be built? To destroy it, and you think the third is going to be built, and what needs to happen to build that temple? What needs to happen? We need good carpenters, <laughs> some masonry. Uh, the third temple is actually synonymous with peace on earth. What we're looking forward to is the world becoming what God envisioned it to be, which, which obviously must happen because God doesn't fail. So although it's taking a few thousand years, but it must, it must eventually happen. So a, div a, a godly world, which is what the whole plan of it is, that the world become godly is an inevitability. Uh, we can make it happen sooner with our efforts, or we can delay it through our misbehaviors. And to the Jewish people, that peace on earth or that godliness on earth will come together with the building of the third temple so that we can go back to being everything we're supposed to be. So the coming of Messiah is not only a faith or a hope, but it's also a project. We're supposed to be doing something to bring that time, to bring that blessing, to make the world messianic, 
so that uh, the world can be what God wants it to be. And that's why we call it serving God. God created the world and God needs it to be a certain way. If we help, then we're serving Him. If we sin, then we're interfering. So being religious or being um, spiritual, godly, is not self-serving. It's serving Him. So when we want the world to be a better world, it's not so much for ourselves as it is for the Creator, which kind of makes sense. I mean, who, invent, who invested more in this creation? He or us? So if I want the world to be perfect, if it bothers me that there is crime, it bothers me that there is unholiness, how much, how much does it bother him? It's his world, not mine. I just work here. <laughs> so if we do our job, we actually bring the messianic blessings. And then Messiah can come and teach us how to be better, teach us how to be... No. We think one time, one successful time is good. The way I understand it, Jesus was a Jew yes. and he was killed by the Jews. Why did they kill him? Well, he wasn't killed by the Jews. In fact, Jews didn't even have the authority back then. We were already under Roman rule. So they didn't have the authority then already? That's right. That's right. <clears throat> so it was the Romans who killed him for political reasons. Um, but Jews never accepted him as the Messiah simply because the, the promise of messianic blessing hasn't yet happened. So whether he will someday be the Messiah? How about the prophecies of Isaiah 53? When, was that already fulfilled or will that be? It depends on how you understand that. Uh, the understanding we have of that is not a description of one individual, but a description of the Jewish people as a whole. And if you read it that way, it fits perfectly. The Jewish people, God's children, uh, we are, we are the, the messengers to the world, God's messenger to the world. We are suffering from others' iniquities. I mean, we fill the bill. So it's not, just, it's not just one Jew, it's all Jews are being described there. I don't mean as individuals, but as a group. So we are God's suffering servants. <laughs> Hopefully we serve as much as we suffer. You mentioned that uh, uh, if the world was a perfect place, there would be no need for sin. What? What happened in the garden? Was it not a perfect place? It obviously was not a perfect place because it got us into a lot of trouble. So uh, having, having, an, uh, having a tree of good and evil makes the existence of evil possible. So what, we, what, we're, what we're doing for the last 5,700 years is having tasted sin, knowing sin up close, we are in a better position to rectify it, to sanctify it, to actually use sin as a motivation, as an inspiration for goodness. When a person has sinned and that thought motivates him, inspires him to be better, then the sin has turned into a virtue. It's actually producing goodness. In the Garden of Eden, there was good and evil, and the evil wasn't doing anything. Having eaten from the tree, we are now responsible and capable of redeeming sin itself. How do you redeem sin? If a sin inspires you to be better, then it has become a force of good. When the world becomes perfected, 
It means that sin no longer exists for its own purpose. It exists only to inspire goodness. And then sin is not sin anymore. So do you have some scripture that you can show that uh, uh, that process for sin? Yeah, in, uh, in Deuteronomy, there is a lengthy, very painful description of the suffering of the Jewish people in the end of days. It's really graphic. I mean, it should, it should, be, uh, it should be restricted. Children shouldn't be allowed to read it. It's really... The chapter is done. Uh, I can give you the Hebrew name. I don't know what the... Uh, I'll, look, I'll look it up for you. But it, it's, I mean, if you haven't read it, it's something you really need to look at. It basically describes a Holocaust. And then it, it says, and when all of these things will have happened to you because you sinned, then you will be scattered throughout the world and in those places where you are scattered, you will realize uh, your mistake and you will return to God and then God will bring you back to the land and everything will be perfect. So it's basically saying the whole sweep of history is the struggle with good and evil, which of course will produce suffering, but in the end, the sinning will have sobered you up and you will find your way back to God, not in spite of your sin, but almost as a result of your sin. And then when you find your way back, then the world can be perfect because evil itself has stopped being evil. So you got, you got to read that. It's uh, kind of towards the end of Deuteronomy. And the end of Deuteronomy, of course, is describing the final, you know, the end of, the end of times and the end, the end result. You asked the question a bit ago. You said, "Who can love that much?" And I wanted to try to give you, from our perspective, what we would believe, and that is, we know we cannot love that much, and we believe that nobody can. So you were right in what you were saying. Uh, we believe that we're all too sinful, and therefore we need a Redeemer. We need a Messiah. We need someone that is perfect, that can take our place for us. And that perfect human being would also have to have experienced the pain and the, and the existence of sin. Otherwise, we're not communicating. Right? Okay. Now, the fact that we can't love God enough, are we held responsible for that? Is there punishment for that? Well, we would believe that we are all uh, endowed with sin, and that comes through our genes. We're born with it, like Jeremiah, that went astray speaking lies from his mother's womb. So we would believe that from Adam, all people that have been born have this sinful nature and that's not acceptable with God. It, right, it's not acceptable and yet it's the way he created us. So is there a plan behind this? Or? We do believe there's a plan. We believe that plan is, is uh, Jesus. Yeah, but and what about... Jesus uh, what was a perfect person but when he was crucified on the cross, we believe that he, he, the sin of the world was put upon him. And so he lived a human life and he suffered the, the penalty for us, just like the animal sacrifices. He became a perfect lamb and we believe that that sacrifice is the acceptable sacrifice between us and God. And the only thing that we can do to become a part of that is not by being good enough, because we can't be good enough, but we believe that we need to receive that. Believe upon that sacrifice as a personal thing for ourselves. And as we do that, God accepts us through that sacrifice. So what is the accomplishment? That's what I'm trying to figure out. There was a fall, and then there's a rise. 
So there's so, redemption. Right. So the redemption takes us back to where we were before or accomplishes something that would not have been accomplished otherwise. So it brings us into that relationship that you're, you were speaking about. Were we in that relationship before we sinned? Yes. So we're just going back to where we were. Yes. So I'm suggesting that there is something accomplished. It's not all in vain. Mm -hmm. There is some closeness that we achieve with God that comes as a result of sin right. when you rectify it that we would not have had we never sinned. So God was not shocked when we sinned. It was all part of the plan. Sure. But one thing you might want to consider. This redemption through the suffering of, of an innocent is still going on as long as the Jewish people are suffering. So this redemption process is an ongoing one. And that's why the world at peace or the world corrected would also mean the end of anti-Semitism. So as long as there's anti-Semitism, we know that there's still some work to be done. <laughs> it's actually encouraging in some way. You said something a little bit ago that was really interesting. You said that, and I, and I wanted to ask you if you could maybe clarify what you were uh, what you were meaning when you said it. You said that Jesus would not be the Messiah, but possibly sometime in the future. It, it, there's a possibility? Is that what you were thinking? As a member of the Jewish people, not, not on his own, because all this suffering since he died is, is not in vain either. So that process is ongoing and includes all Jews. So every Jewish suffering is part of that redemption. Mm -hmm. Is that teaching not true? We have heard from another leader uh, that Jesus was his suffering would have not been acceptable because he was he stepped out of his bounds. Any suffering is acceptable. The question is, is it enough? Does it do the whole job? If, if his suffering was enough, there wouldn't be any continued suffering. So obviously there's still a need. So you don't feel like he stepped out of his bounds? You don't, uh, we have heard teaching where a rabbi has explained to us that Jesus was a prophet, but then he stepped out of his bounds. He, he was doing more than what he had the authority to do. That could be. Maybe he was premature. But you still feel his suffering as a result of stepping out of his bounds would still be acceptable as part of the suffering that it's going to take. Yeah, we're all, we're all in some way divine and in some way human. That's true of everybody, not just of him. Also, the, the uh, question, a, a different subject, but... I forget which book it is, but I think it would be in in your Bible. God talks about our Bible, our Bible, about a new covenant. What is He talking about? Yeah. About the new covenant? Good, good question. First of all, what does new covenant mean? A covenant is something that cannot be broken. That's what covenant means. <laughs> so somebody said to me. Well, you used to be a part of the covenant, but then God took it away from you and gave it to us. Well, then you can keep it. <laughs> I mean, if, if it can be taken away, then it's not a covenant. A covenant means this will never change. Right? So what does it mean to have a new covenant? And then will there be a new one after that new one? <laughs> like, where does this end? So a new covenant certainly doesn't mean canceling the previous one, because you can't cancel a covenant. Otherwise, it's not a covenant at all. A new covenant means we know how to serve God in an imperfect world. And the imperfection itself motivates us. We get up in the morning because we know the world needs fixing. I mean, even physically. You got to plow or nothing will grow. You got to take care of the, of the, of the, of the wheat or it will be destroyed. You got to worry about the rain coming, because without the rain, it ain't. So, 
the world needs so much attention, needs so much work, and that motivates us. After the Messiah comes, there will be no need for that. That's when the new covenant. So we're going to have to learn how to serve God without the inspiration of, if you don't get up on time, it's all going to be ruined. <laughs> so if that's not inspiring us, if that's not motivating us, then what will? How does perfection or goodness motivate more goodness? We really don't know. Or not very well, anyway. And by the way, that is one of the differences between men and women. Men are very inspired by what might go wrong. Women are inspired by what is already right. And that's why we don't understand each other. <laughs> Because men look at women and say, what are you so happy about? <laughs> things need to be fixed. Things need to be built. Everything's there. Problems. What are you happy about? So, well, we're married. So, yeah. <laughs> but. And for the women, there's no but. We're married. We have a family. We have children. We have a house. It's great. And the man is saying, yeah, but the house needs a new wing. We've got to build on a new room. We've got to make a... And the woman is saying, look, we have a house. Enjoy. <laughs> a man says, you know, I got married. A woman says, you know, I am married. Man is always thinking, I got married. I did something. I fixed something. I accomplished something. The woman says, I am married. Isn't that good? Yeah. Um, can you explain the, the first Passover that was insti instituted uh, when the, just before the children of uh, Israel went out of Egypt. What was involved in preparing the Passover, how they were supposed to eat it, and about the blood that was sprinkled? Generally, when we speak of uh, sacrifices, we think of uh, what are they called? Uh, sin offerings, right? Sacrifices are brought because you committed a sin and you need to be forgiven and so on. Now, the Paschal lamb was certainly not for forgiveness because we weren't guilty of any sins. In fact, we had paid for whatever sins we might have committed by the enslavement in Egypt. And besides, the commandments hadn't even been given yet. So that certainly was not a sin offering. It was a festival offering. And that's why you had to eat the meat of the Paschal lamb. And you weren't allowed to waste any of it. Because it wasn't there for atonement. It was there for celebration. So the Paschal lamb is one of those um, thanksgiving offerings, not sin offerings. I thought it had to do with the death angel going through the... Yeah, that was... The, the, uh, the putting the blood on the doorpost was to signify that this is a Jewish house and not, uh, not subject to the punishment of the firstborn. But, it, but it, was not, it was not your typical sacrifice. Yeah? What is your hope about death? The hope about death? What do you, what do you think about death? It's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe in it. No. Death is unnatural, and it's got to, you know, run its course and then stop. So after the Messiah comes, there will be no death. Like it was meant to be. Adam and Eve were never meant to die. So again, that's their original nature. And we must eventually get back to our original nature where there is no death. So death itself will have been conquered. Basically, what I'm saying is that soon death will stop existing and people will stop dying because it will have served its purpose and it will no, long, no, no longer be necessary. So if, if you would die today, you, you believe you have a soul? And where would your soul go? 
Well, there's, there's the world of souls, which we call heaven, but heaven is a very general, vague word. Souls go back to where souls come from, just like the body goes back to where the body comes from, from dust to dust. So the soul goes back to the place of souls, and after the Messiah comes, uh, all those souls will come back into their bodies, and that is the resurrection. So when death stops existing, then body and soul will no longer be separated, even those souls that have left their bodies will come back into bodies. Because when this world becomes as holy as it should be, then it is holier than the world of souls. Because it's a redeemed world, which is much higher than a world that was never in trouble. So there is benefit to the sin when you conquer it. It brings you to a higher, more godly place. And then the souls in heaven would rather be in a body because it would be holier to be in a body than to be without. Today, it's holier to be without. Is every Jew um, eligible for just that, what you said? Every Jewish soul eventually gets purified through dying, through suffering, through atonement, through... So yes, eventually every Jewish soul will be eligible. Is, is but it because the, the Jews are, are considered as the people of God? The chosen people? God's children. So every righteous person deserves to be resurrected, and the Jewish soul, being that it's destined for eternity, will eventually be eligible through a cleansing process. So here's another thing. Hell is not a punishment because punishment seems to be uh, endless or pointless. Hell is a cleansing process by which the soul gets rid of whatever unholiness it, uh, it attracted or contracted so that it can it can experience holiness um, fully without the interference of sin. Where so, did you, where did you learn that? Reader's Digest, I think. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not brilliant>. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, we, we, don't, we don't believe in eternal punishment. Because eternal punishment means that the evil goes on forever and still needs to be punished. Well, we don't believe that evil can go on forever. That's not right. So it must be that the evil eventually ends. If evil eventually ends, then punishment for sin has got to end. And, um, and the benefits or the, um, the results of the suffering is that we're now clean again. Otherwise, the suffering has no point. So to think of God as just vengeful is not, is not acceptable. What's going to happen with the evil one that was spoken of by the garden? Is he going to become righteous someday again too? Yes. All evil has to be temporary. Only God is eternal. So only goodness can be eternal. So that would mean if a Jewish person would, or anybody, likes the pleasures of sin, they could just enjoy the pleasures of sin without any efforts and still end up in the right place. Well, it's true. No matter how dirty you get yourself, if you take a hot enough shower, you'll be clean again. But who wants that hot shower? So God is not saying that you can destroy the world forever. You can't. Evil doesn't have that power. It cannot frustrate God's plan. Mm -hmm. It can only delay it. So if you don't indulge in sin and live sincerely, you won't have to go through the punishment of a hot shower. That's right. That's right. And you are serving God's purpose. So how long is the hot shower? Is that a thousand years or? Oh, it depends for whom. <laughs> 
Let's take a look at the list of sins and we'll see. But it, it can go on for a long time, but not forever. Because forever is only God. Our Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So Is that true? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's his blood that does it, but it is saying that eventually everything is cleansed. Now, I was asking you if that's true. That his blood brings forgiveness? That his blood cleanses us from all sin. No. All suffering brings some cleansing. And there's been a lot of suffering since he suffered. So all suffering brings cleansing. And that's why it's still going on. It's not unnecessary suffering. So it's true. Every time a person suffers, there's a cleansing going on. And uh, the more important a person is, the more important or significant his suffering is. But just one person suffering obviously was not sufficient because we're still suffering. And you can say, well, that's because we didn't accept him. Whatever the reason is, the point is, this suffering is still accomplishing something. It's not in vain. We never suffer in vain. So all suffering brings forgiveness. And no one suffering is sufficient. I think that history proves that. Leviticus says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That was only for unintentional sin. If you read, it says, if a person sins... Yeah, 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 the, the sentence right before that. It says, if when a person sins unintentionally, he brings this kind of a sacrifice. For intentional sin, sacrifice doesn't help. There's personal suffering. How about when Cora went down in the hell? How'd you make that? You went down in the hell. How'd you figure that out? I think most of us are going to go down to hell for some period of time to get cleansed, but it's not forever. Not, not forever, huh? I'm not going there. You're not going? <laughs> I joke about this, but when people say, um, don't you want to be saved from hell? I say, what, and go to heaven? Who am I going to know there? <laughs> All my friends are going. You know, I want to go where my friends are going. So, <laughs> hell, is not, hell is not an eternal suffering. It's a cleansing process, including the children of Korach and his, and his group. You, you can read that somewhere. In fact, where, where does it actually say, you descend to the pit and then rise? What am I, what am I quoting? Huh? Jesus did that in Psalms. So you go down to the pit and then you rise. You don't stay there forever. Because the pit doesn't last forever. Jesus did that for us. Well, I don't know if he did it for us or we're going to do it for ourselves. But the point is, it doesn't last forever. After going down, you come back up. That, I mean, that's what punishment means. Punishment means corrective, redemption, not just vengeance. We were, we were talking earlier about Jesus being crucified and buried Some of those things, and the only place that I ever knew that it was written is in the New Testament. But you reject the New Testament, is that right? So, how do you actually know about that Jesus actually lived on Earth and got killed? He was a Jew. We, we know we know our family. We know we know our history. So here here again, let me let me sum it up for you. There is a people. God's chosen people, God's children, God's firstborn, however you want to describe it. That is a light to the nations, a messenger to the world, because we stood at Mount Sinai and we received the revelation. And it's our job to share that with the world, to inspire the rest of the world, to be a model for the rest of the world. That's our job. It also includes being resented being hated, being persecuted. So 
whatever the New Testament says about one Jew is really true of the Jewish people as a whole. So we see it more as a symbolic thing. There's one Jew who is the symbol of our history, of our experience. And until all Jews stop suffering or are resurrected, the world is not complete. So the, the practical and important thing is we all agree that the world needs to be redeemed and that that's going to happen through a Messiah. But just to sit and wait is not good enough. Just to believe that it will happen is not good enough. We are actually active partners in making that happen. So when we fulfill the commandments, when we serve God properly, not perfectly, but sincerely, we're actually making the world ready and capable of receiving the Messiah. So the practical and, and important thing is, what can I do to make this happen? To believe that it's going to happen, that's reassuring, but that's not what we're here for. We are here to make it happen so that when the Messiah comes, we will be able to say, I, I helped. I did my share. I was part of the process. So the sooner Jews go back to keeping the commandments as, as best as, as is humanly possible in, in the world today, then the sooner the world will be ready for the Messiah, the sooner the Messiah can come, and the sooner God's plan can be fulfilled to give him the pleasure that he's looking forward to from his creation. Yeah? Okay, two more questions. Is, there, is it in the Old Testament where it says that our good works are like filthy rags? I don't recall. I don't, that's not familiar. Isaiah 64. Hmm? Isaiah 64 says that. Filthy rags? Our, our good works are like filthy rags. You have to say it in Hebrew for me to relate to it. There are, there are critical statements about our efforts. That doesn't mean that when we fulfill his commandments, it's filthy rags. His commandments can never be called filthy rags. It's when we think we're being good, when we do what we think is right. That can be corrupted with arrogance and things like that. But his commandments? We would never call his commandments filthy rags. So what, what would be your... Uh, you said there's 613 commandments for the Jewish people. What would be your message to give Gentiles hope? What, what, do we have to follow 613 commandments? Or can you explain a little bit here? Yeah. There were six commandments that were given to Adam and Eve. After the flood, they were repeated to Noah, and a seventh commandment was added, and that was not to be cruel to animals. These seven laws, Noahide laws they're called, these seven laws are basically the uh, moral code that God gives all human beings. Any human being living by these seven commandments is a righteous person. So there's no mystery as to who is right and who is wrong, who is good and who is bad. There are seven things. Check them off. If you're doing them, you are righteous. If you're not doing them, well, do them. Start now. Now, these seven commandments uh, basically make the world inhabitable. Without these seven commandments, life wouldn't be possible. Like no murder, no stealing, no kidnapping, no adultery. Without these laws, there is no life at all. We can mistakenly assume that we observe these commandments to preserve ourselves. And that would not be right. The message of Jews to the world is 
the seven Noahide laws that every human being should observe and that makes a human being righteous should be observed for God's benefit, not for our own. And what benefit does God need? He needs his world to live up to his expectations. So when we serve God, and literally that's what we're doing, by keeping these seven commandments, we're, we're really being bigger or greater than ourselves. We are here to serve him. We don't sit here waiting for him to serve us. That's the message. And the sooner the world gets around to that, I mean, can you imagine if all religions were focused on the fact that God needs us to serve him? That itself would bring peace to the world. Because if I'm convinced that God needs you to serve him, how can I hate you? How can I dismiss you? Without you, my God is not complete. That itself would bring peace to the world. But if everybody is following a religion for their own reasons and own purposes and for their own benefits and rewards, well, then we're going to have arguments. Then we're going to disagree. Then we're going to argue. And it's going to turn into a war. So real peace comes when we're all focused on one point, And that is, is God getting what he needs from us? That makes it a universal issue. That means we're all in the same boat. And that if I do what God wants from me perfectly, I'm still not happy because you're not giving him what he wants, so he is not content, so I'm not content. So, the message is this. There are commandments that we all know about and we're all keeping. But what would be really helpful is the realization that these commandments are not for our benefit, not just to get us to heaven, but to get God the kind of world that he wants, that he created it to be. So in the service of him, we can all be united.